TWA jumbo jet on a routine flight from New York to Paris, France. Suddenly, it explodes and plunges, burning into the Atlantic. There are over 200 people on board. Is it a missile attack, a terrorist bomb, or a catastrophic mechanical failure? Now, using advanced computer simulation, we reveal what really went wrong on flight TWA-800. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. America, New York City. John F. Kennedy Airport, July 17, 1996. Security is tight at New York's busiest airport. Tens of thousands of people will pass through JFK today on some 1,000 flights. They are all potential targets for terrorist attack. In nearby Manhattan, terrorist Ramzi Youssef is in the US federal court. He's on trial for trying to blow up the World Trade Center with a 600 kilogram truck bomb. But he's also accused of masterminding a plot to kill hundreds of innocent people with bombs planted on 12 US airplanes. The FBI knows that many members of Youssef's terrorist cell remain at large and could still target planes for attack. We were in a very high state of alert in the United States. Uh, we'd had numerous, numerous threats, hundreds of threats. Heading to JFK today are two young college students from Macon, Georgia. Becky Olson is 20 years old. She's been best friends with 19-year-old Michelle Becker since high school. They're excited. Today they'll fly to Paris for a friend's wedding, followed by a backpacking holiday around Europe. The girl's parents have given the trip their blessing. They were very excited to be going. They just knew it was going to be a wonderful new adventure. They thought that this was just going to be the best thing since chocolate cake. This will be an extra special trip. Michelle's dad, Walter Becker, has saved enough air miles to upgrade the girls to first class. Back then, first class was first class, and I, I felt that they would really enjoy that, both going and, and returning back home. 4.31 p.m. The Boeing 747 that will become TWA Flight 800 to Paris arrives at JFK. It's 25 years old and has more than 16,000 flights under its belt. Tanker trucks move in to fuel up the plane. The ground crew pumps 114,000 liters of Jet A fuel into the six wing tanks. It's more than enough to fly to Paris. The biggest tank, the center wing tank, can stay as it is, almost empty. Just outside Baltimore, Maryland, 29-year-old Jamie Hurd finishes up last-minute chores at the family garage. Yeah, okay, you pick it up Tuesday. How's that? All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Since joining two years ago, Jamie has computerized the office for his dad, Jim. You know, he kind of brought us into the, the present age, from back from the dark ages. Jamie is flying to Paris to hook up with his girlfriend, Hope, who's in France on an exchange visit. It's his first flight to Europe. Inside JFK's Terminal 5, Michelle Becker calls home to ask her mother for advice. Hi, Mom. TWA is offering cash incentives for passengers to take a later flight. Do you think we should take the bomb flight? Because I think we can get some money. What do you think? It's a tough dilemma. The girls don't want to risk losing their free upgrade, but as students, they could use the money. 6 p.m. 212 passengers board Flight 800 in good time for a 7 p.m. takeoff. Among them is Jamie Hurd. He's only eight hours away from seeing his girlfriend, Hope. In 
charge of the crew this evening is Captain Steven Snyder. With 4,700 hours of flying time on 747s, he's one of TWA's most experienced pilots. Flying alongside Snyder is Captain Ralph Kevorkian, another TWA veteran. Seven p.m. Captain Snyder and the flight crew are ready to go, but there's a problem. One of the passengers is not on board, but her bags are already in the hold. In 1988, Pan Am 103 exploded in mid-air over the town of Lockerbie in Scotland, killing 270 people. Terrorists checked a bag containing a bomb into the hold, but didn't board the plane. Since then, planes cannot take off with a bag in the hold if the passenger who checked it is not on board. The plane is delayed while ground staff hunt for the missing passenger. Outside, it's 28 degrees Celsius, and on the asphalt of the apron, the jumbo is getting hot. As the minutes tick by, air conditioning units under the fuselage keep the passengers cool. 50 minutes go by, and there is still no sign of the mystery passenger. At 7.59 p.m., gate personnel contact the crew. TWA Flight 800, sorry about that delay. We have confirmation that the passenger is on board. They were on board the whole time. 8.19. At last, Captain Kevorkian throttles up the 747. Flight 800 lifts off an hour and 20 minutes late. TWA 800's flight path will take it through some of the most congested airspace in the USA. It will also skirt the boundary of a US military zone to the south. Air traffic control keeps flights well clear of any restricted airspace during weapons testing. 831, Flight 800 climbs into the evening sky. Eastwind Airlines pilot David McLean is flying a 737 into Trenton, New Jersey. He sees the jumbo jet ahead of him. It was a nice night, good visibility. There's a lot of traffic going out there, so you always got to keep your eyes out. Air traffic control clears Flight 800 to climb to its next level. TWA 800, heavy turn left, heading 050, vector climbing around traffic. Climb the 15,000. Crew and passengers settle in for the flight. Then, suddenly. And I thought, gee, I must have. Two to three hundred people on board. I thought it was a bomb. Twelve minutes out of JFK on a routine trip to Paris. TWA Flight 800 explodes in a huge fireball. At air traffic control, Flight 800 suddenly disappears off radar screens. East Winds pilot David McLean reports in to air traffic control. We just saw an explosion out here, about 16,000 feet. Just went down into the water. Air traffic control tries to raise Flight 800 on the radio. TWA 800, if you hear center, ident. There's no response. TWA 800, if you hear center, ident. The terrible truth starts to dawn. TWA 800, center. Thousands of meters below, a helicopter from the Air National Guard flying on a training mission is caught beneath the blast. I looked over my right shoulder and this fire 
exploded across the sky and came down like a curtain, like napalm. Flaming aircraft debris starts to fall all around them. Some of it was still on fire. We actually saw embers. Now the helicopter crew is in danger. If debris hits the rotor blades, they too could crash into the water. We have to get out of here. The helicopter makes it away safely. They race to get help. Back at base, Major Mike Noyes prepares to take command of the helicopter and head out to the crash site. Obviously the adrenaline's starting to flow. I'm thinking we're going out to search for survivors. He knows that it is possible to survive a plane crash into water. And the sea temperature is around 18 degrees Celsius. If there are people in the water, they could stay alive for up to eight hours. The Coast Guard at East Mauritius, Long Island, gets the word that a plane has gone down. Stand by your lights. They speed out to sea. First on the scene is the Air National Guard rescue helicopter. The sea below them is on fire. Picture a campfire that's a quarter of a half mile long, but the flames are, oh, I don't know, they're at least 10 feet high. Meanwhile, reports of the disaster start to break on the news channels. This is the latest we have on the flight that crashed tonight of TWA Flight 800 into the waters off Long Island, New York. This was on its way. Among those watching are Aurelie and Walter Becker. They realize it's the flight of their daughter, Michelle. The first pictures you saw were shot from the helicopter with the debris field and the flames coming out of the water. And uh, uh, I said, oh my God. But then Orly Becker remembers Michelle's last-minute phone call from the airport. Do you think we should take the bomb flight? Because I think we can get some money. Michelle told her mother that TWA were offering cash incentives to take a later flight. Orly recalls with horror that she advised Michelle and her friend Becky to stay on flight 800. Now she prays that the girls ignored her advice. I said, I wonder if they ever really got on the flight. Maybe they did take a jump seat and, and they aren't on it. Orally calls Becky's parents. She speaks to Becky's father, Donald Olson. Hey, Orly, what's up? I said, you didn't get a call from Becky that they took a, a bump ticket, did you? Donald says no. The girls didn't call. And Arlie said, there's been a plane crash. We need to turn on CNN. A 747 aircraft has exploded in midair about 20 miles south of New York's Long Island into the Atlantic Ocean. The families realize Michelle and Becky did get on the flight. Now all they can do is helplessly watch the horrifying scenes. But they still hope that their girls may have survived the crash. You know, you talk to each other and you hold each other and you cry and you you say, well, you know, the girls were very athletic. They were good swimmers. Search and rescue, we know, is a nightmare. They are looking for people who survived this. I just told Becky to swim hard. All night long. Families all over the United States and beyond endure a waking nightmare. Their only hope that somewhere in the darkened water, their loved ones cling on to life long enough to be rescued. After three hours of searching, none of the hundreds of rescuers can find a single survivor. They've covered 13 square kilometers of ocean. It's now clear that all 230 people on board died in the crash. The helicopter rescue team heads back to base. We did our best that night to uh, try and find anyone who could have survived that crash. And uh, to return empty-handed was uh, 
very glow glow. Sun rises on an ocean littered with the remains of Flight 800. Boat crews bring pieces of wreckage to the Coast Guard station at East Mauritius. Rescuers have recovered 73 bodies, but no survivors. Jamie Hurd's father, Jim, realizes that any hope his 29 year old son made it through alive is gone. It's not a good time in your life. You know, you're just thinking about, really thinking about one thing. And to me, the one thing was that I was, uh, I was going to go get Jamie and bring him home. News reaches the FBI and New York Assistant Director James Colstrom. Colstrom immediately suspects the crash is no accident. My gut told me that this was probably an intervention by some criminal, some terrorist. Less than 12 hours after Flight 800 plunged burning into the water, investigators survey the impact site. Even hardened law officers like Kallstrom are shocked by the destruction. I'll never forget the scene of miles, seemed like miles of debris. Pilots who were near the jet when it exploded tell FBI agents that the blast came out of the blue. But witnesses on the ground report something highly suspicious. We had 50, 60 people that had called in and said, I saw things in the sky. Some described them as ascending towards this fireball. Over time, 258 people tell the FBI they saw something streaking through the sky at the moment the 747 was lost. I followed the streak of light. Red, orange in color, moving from my left center to my further left. Two people even caught an image on camera. One photo shows a mysterious trail in the sky. The other appears to show an object shaped like a missile. Karlstrom faces a horrifying possibility. was Flight 800 shot down by a terrorist missile. Such an attack just a few kilometers off the U.S. mainland would represent a new escalation of the terror threat facing America and the West. The U.S. supplied shoulder-held ground-to-air missile launches to Islamic freedom fighters in Afghanistan. Karlstrom knows that many of these weapons are now in the hands of terrorists determined to strike at America. But the launches only have a range of 8 kilometers. Since Flight 800 came down 13 kilometers from land, a missile of this type could only have been fired from the ocean. So the crime scene became, really, thousands of square miles of ocean and thousands of square miles of Long Island and New York City Harbor. And it, it was a massive undertaking. Now, by rewinding the events and going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened to Flight 800. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. Agents interview 670 eyewitnesses. They painstakingly check the movements of 20,000 craft in the area. They seize stolen and abandoned boats and run forensic tests on them. But they can't find any promising leads. Then the missile theory takes a new and astonishing turn. Stories and rumors begin to circulate on the internet and in the press. They make an extraordinary allegation. The TWA Flight 800 was shot down, not by terrorists, but in a terrible accident by the US military. Kallstrom learns that there were eight military ships, eight submarines, and five military planes within 550 kilometers of the crash site. A P-3 plane and a sub were in the middle of training exercises. He orders dozens of FBI agents to scrutinize all their logs. After weeks of checking, they verify that no missiles were unaccounted for. No missiles were fired that night. 
the FBI also check out the two suspicious photographs. They find that in one, the photographer was facing in completely the opposite direction to Flight 800. Technicians conclude that the object captured is actually an airplane. They also find that the mysterious trail on the other is simply residue on the film. The FBI concludes that the friendly fire theory is groundless. But the story doesn't go away. Now Pierre Salinger, John F. Kennedy's former press secretary, raises the stakes with an astonishing intervention. He says there's been a cover-up. Flight 800 was shot down by a U.S. Navy missile. And he has the evidence to prove it. 13 kilometers off Long Island. 37 meters down, Navy divers grapple with a mammoth task. Recovering the remains of TWA Flight 800, scattered over an area of 104 square kilometers. Meanwhile, the FBI follow up a new and disturbing allegation. John Kennedy's former press secretary, Pierre Salinger, claims to have evidence that the U.S. Navy shot down Flight 800 by mistake. We have now reached the point where we are totally sure that what we are saying is true. He produces an air traffic control radar tape showing a mystery object close to the doomed jet. What we see here is a missile about to hit TWA 800. Many people suspicious about the crash support Salinger's claims. His thesis points to the missile being fired by the USS Normandy, an Aegis-class missile cruiser which was at sea 340 kilometers south of Long Island. The FBI re-examines US Navy activity in the area. It quickly finds that the USS Normandy was at least 160 kilometers beyond the range from which its missiles could hit Flight 800. We accounted for every piece of ordnance on the Normandy and every other military ship in, in the region. We looked at every submarine under the ocean. We looked at every aircraft transiting the area, even though they were not capable of shooting a missile and taking an airplane down. But they find nothing. Scientists analyze the radar tape. They discover the traces are just interference. It's a well-known phenomenon called radar ghosting. They are simply duplicate images of Jet Express Flight 18 flying nearby. The friendly fire claims cost thousands of hours of investigators' time. An exasperated Colstrom lambasts the conspiracy theorists at a news conference. I can assure you that we've looked at every angle, every possibility, and the military of this country has had nothing to do with this horrendous tragedy. A terrorist bomb or missile is still one of the chief suspects for the loss of Flight 800. But the only way of finding out for sure what down the plane is to analyze the wreckage. That job falls to the FBI's co-investigators, the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. Their priority, to find the plane's flight recorders or black boxes. Since the day after the crash, Navy divers had scoured the debris zone in the deep waters off Long Island. It's slow and dangerous work. The seabed is littered with razor-sharp fragments. Six days into the search, and there's no sign of the black boxes. It's possible that ocean currents have buried them in the sand. Then, on day seven, a diver spots something. A flash of orange. The cockpit voice recorder. Hits in. You see the beacon right on it? You want to take a picture of it? Right. It's the cockpit voice recorder.
Within seconds, they get lucky again. The flight data recorder lies just meters away. They got both of them? Holy cow! <laughs> Divers quickly bring the boxes to the surface. To prevent damage by oxidation, they keep them submerged in salt water. For NTSB investigator Bob Swain, it's a potential breakthrough. As the divers bring the boxes up, the NTSB side of the staff, we typically get pretty excited. But there's a problem. The boxes are twisted and broken open from the massive impact. Investigators fear that there's little chance the tapes inside will have survived. But they rush them to NTSB headquarters. There they hope they can retrieve something from the recorders. Carefully, they remove the cockpit voice tape from inside the armored casing and thread it onto a player. Against all the odds, the tape is intact and playable. TWA 800, heavy turn left heading 050, vector climbing around traffic. Left, zero, five, zero, climb vector. They carefully analyze all the pilot's conversations and the readings from the data recorder. Stop climb at one, three thousand. And the electric? They scour the last seconds of the recording electric for any off. clues to the plane's sudden loss. Climb the one, five thousand. But at eight, thirty-one and twelve seconds, the recording cuts off suddenly. Whatever happened to Flight 800, the pilots had no time to react. The excitement of the find turns to bitter disappointment. The voice recorder, and the same with the data recorder, really told us nothing. Now the investigators must rely entirely on the salvaged wreckage of the doomed jet for clues. If Flight 800 was brought down by a bomb or a missile, it would leave evidence behind. NTSB metallurgists examine the fragments under scanning electron microscopes. They're looking for the distinctive micro-pitting which high explosive leaves on metal surfaces. As a veteran of the Pan Am 103 investigation, metallurgist Jim Wildey knows exactly what bomb damage looks like but he finds no trace of it. We looked at every piece, every square inch of every piece, every fracture, every surface. Each piece as it came in was examined in detail for evidence of, of a bomb or explosion, and there simply was no evidence of that type on the TWA area. At the same time, FBI forensic experts take over 9,000 samples for chemical analysis. They know that traces of explosive can survive even underwater. For weeks, they too find nothing. But then, the FBI makes a momentous discovery. Microscopic explosive traces of unknown origin have been found relating to TWA Flight 800. I got a call from our chief forensic chemist at the site who had found some minute traces of RDX and PETN, which are two chemicals that are in plastic explosives. Investigators finally seem to be closing in on an explanation, and increasingly it looks like a bomb. It's an extraordinary find. The traces survived weeks of immersion in 37 meters of seawater. They were preserved under a piece of sticky tape joining the carpet tiles. It's compelling evidence for a terrorist bomb on board Flight 800. But Kallstrom is skeptical. It made no sense. <laughs> I mean, the initial reaction was, wow! But the facts made no sense. The flooring that was recovered, there was no sign of an explosion. The FBI probes the doomed airplane's history for explanations. They painstakingly explore the dozens of occasions when TWA hired the plane out between flights to third parties. Then, agents make a critical discovery. Just one month before the crash, police in St. Louis hired the plane to train sniffer dogs. 
the police dog handlers tell the FBI they used RDX and PETN, the exact same substances found in the wreckage of Flight 800. And they also revealed that one of the training aids was cracked and may have leaked tiny amounts of explosives material. The bomb traces are real, but they are not the cause of the crash. The criminal investigation hits a brick wall. Six months after the disaster, the FBI has found no evidence of a missile strike or terrorist bomb. Now the NTSB focuses on catastrophic mechanical failure as the likely cause of the crash. In the hangar at Calverton, New York, Jim Wildey and his team start to reassemble the 747 from almost one million pieces of debris. It takes them three months to complete the center section. The fuselage is riddled with fractures. To trace where the plane's breakup started, Wildey first needs to calculate the sequence of the fractures. All of these early fractures stem from one location, and that was right here in the fuselage, just in front of the front spar, near the bottom of the airplane. The fracture sequence allows Wildey to work out how the plane broke up. The fractures underneath the plane radiate out, tearing away part of the belly of the plane. With the bottom of the fuselage gone, new fractures race upwards on both sides of the jumbo jet. When they meet, the nose is torn away from the rest of the plane. Now Wildey must find what triggered the initial fracturing. He looks behind the spot where the fractures begin. It's the site of the 747's biggest fuel tank, the massive center wing tank. It's as big as a two-car garage. Panels of aluminium, called spanwise beams, divide the space into sections. Wildey hunts for clues. Inside the tank, he discovers something disturbing. A series of dents in the front of the tank, known as the front spar. It's an extraordinary discovery. Wildey believes the dents were caused by spanwise beams slamming into it. The most likely scenario for the damage? An explosion inside the tank. This impact damage it fractured, it buckled and it damaged these stiffeners and started the breakup of the front spar and then the continued breakup of the airplane from this point. Wilde is convinced an explosion in the center wing tank must have been the fatal trigger for the plane's breakup. The obvious culprit for such a blast, jet fuel. Investigators examine the fueling records at JFK. They find that the ground crew left Flight 800's center wing tank almost empty, with just 190 liters of Jet A fuel in it. That's just a puddle in the bottom. It seems a small amount of fuel to cause such extensive damage. But Wildey knows that Jet A fuel has unusual properties, as this footage, taken at Federal Aviation Authority testing labs, shows. In its liquid state, jet A fuel is not highly flammable. But when it's enclosed in a tank and heated up, it vaporizes, becoming easy to ignite. Now investigators must discover whether the fuel in Flight 800's center wing tank could have been heated to flashpoint. They know that right underneath the center wing tank lie the plane's air conditioning packs. They produce cool, breathable cabin air using hot air taken from the jet engines. So we have this extremely hot air, hot enough to cook a chicken, within inches of the bottom of the tank itself. Investigators calculate that the flashpoint of the fuel in the center wing tank would be remarkably low, just 35.8 degrees Celsius. 
Could the air conditioners have heated the fuel enough to reach this critical temperature? To find out, NTSB and FAA scientists mount an audacious experiment to restage Flight 800. They fill the center wing tank of a 747 with 189 liters of jet A fuel and fit it with 90 temperature sensors. The plane sits on the tarmac with the air conditioning on for 2 hours and 45 minutes. Then the 747 takes off. It follows the same ascent profile as Flight 800. It's a calculated risk, but no greater than thousands of planes undergo every day. Twelve minutes later, it reaches 4,200 meters, the point at which TWA 800 exploded. Investigators examine the readings from the temperature sensors. What they find horrifies them. The temperature in the center wing tank is 53 degrees Celsius, a full 17 degrees past the fuel's flash point. The test flight conclusively showed that the center wing tank had become flammable. To confirm that it could cause a blast strong enough to rupture the reinforced aluminum center wing tank, engineers build a one-quarter scale model. They fill it with jet fuel vapor. Then they ignite it. The force of the blast is more than enough to rupture the tank. The tests were able to show the pressures that could develop in the tank to the point that it would burst. But investigators are mystified about what might have ignited the fuel vapor. They know there were seven in-flight fuel tank explosions in the previous 33 years. All were triggered by dramatic events such as lightning strikes, sabotage, or even an engine falling off. Bob Swain investigates these and dozens more potential ignition sources. He concludes that the ignition source must be something electrical inside the fuel tank. As we ruled out numerous potential ignition sources, what we came back to again and again was the wiring and the fuel quantity indication system. Wires run from the cockpit to fuel probes inside the center wing tank. The wiring crosses near the top of the fuel tank routed to the terminal block, as you see here. Swaim studies the terminal block. He discovers that it has dangerously sharp edges. And it was sharp and hard enough that it could cut through the insulation of the wiring. Swaim suspects there may well have been an exposed wire in the fuel tank. That could create a dangerous spark. But there's a puzzle. The wires inside the fuel tank are designed to carry a very low voltage, too low to cause a spark. Swaim follows the fuel probe wires outside the fuel tank. Here they join high voltage wires for the cabin lights and other aircraft systems which run in bundles through the belly of the 25-year-old plane. He looks more closely at the surviving wiring on the crashed 747 and on other jumbo jets of a similar age and makes a disturbing discovery. We were shocked by the condition of the wiring we found. Swaim finds the remains of fluid spills and sharp metal shavings among the bundles of wire. He also finds chafed wires, wires repaired with tape and even some with cracked insulation. He concludes that the poor state of wiring on older 747s could allow high voltage electricity to jump into the fuel tank wires. It could then pass into the fuel tank, causing a short circuit. The resulting spark would ignite the fuel vapor. Investigators know there are some 1,200 other 747s in service around the world. 
Any one of them could be flying with a fatal flaw, putting thousands of passengers in serious danger. The NTSB believe a fuel tank explosion blew apart Flight 800 when a short circuit caused a fatal spark. But they have no proof. Short circuits often leave no physical trace in wiring. Their one hope of proving the theory is the plane's black boxes, which hold the only surviving flight data. 800, heavy turn left heading 050, vector climbing around traffic. The 13 minute cockpit voice recording seems unremarkable. Climb the 15000. But as they replay the tape, investigators hear something intriguing. Just before the recording cuts off, there are two minuscule pauses. They're each just two microseconds long. But they're telltale signs of a momentary loss of power to the recorder. It's an astounding discovery. The pause in the recording backs the investigators' theory that there was a short circuit on Flight 800. And it could happen on any one of 1,200 other 747s in service around the world. It's the final piece of the puzzle. Investigators now know the probable chain of events that triggered the loss of TWA Flight 800. What tore apart a 300-ton jumbo jet just 12 minutes into a routine flight and left 230 passengers and crew seconds from disaster. 12 and a half minutes to disaster. Flight 800 takes off. Air conditioners have been keeping passengers cool during the delay. But they've also heated the jet A fuel in the center wing tank to flashpoint. It's now filled with almost 50 cubic meters of highly explosive fuel air mix. The 747 is a flying bomb. 44 seconds to go. Climb the 15,000. Damaged wiring allows high voltage current to jump into wiring outside the center wing tank and run down into the tank. When the current reaches a section of bare wire, it jumps to another metal surface, forming a short circuit. The resulting spark ignites the deadly mix of fuel and air. Disaster strikes. The explosion blows out one of the inner panels. It strikes the tank's outer skin, smashing it into the plane's fuselage. At a speed of some 650 kilometers per hour, the aircraft is flying under massive pressure. And the first fuselage fracture spreads fast. Now multiple fractures race around the plane. In four seconds, they meet, severing the 747's nose. The nose plunges downward like a bullet. The rest of the plane, with most of the passengers still in it, soars upwards. Investigators believe that this is the trail of light eyewitnesses see streaking up into the sky. At 4,600 meters, the main section stalls. A tiny spark has brought down the enormous jumbo jet, killing 230 people. It's over a year before remains of all the crash victims are identified, most by using DNA analysis. The families of the victims band together to build a memorial to their loved ones on Long Island. The monument in Smith Point is a labor of love. They got a, a piece of black marble that they made the centerpiece of it, inscribing all the names on the front. It's a place for Jim Hurd to remember his son, Jamie. This is, this is the closest place I can be to where he's, he's buried because really most of him's out there in the ocean. Or that's where he, he went. Um. When the fire broke out, 
fog begins to roll in with the very early morning when the when the mist is gently there you can feel the presence of souls the disaster is a wake-up call to the aviation industry the Federal Aviation Administration issues more than 70 airworthiness directives to eliminate any possible source of accidental ignition and improve insulation of wiring to fuel tanks. They affect 7,500 aircraft in the U.S. transport fleet. Boeing implements the FAA orders and also introduces fuel tank inerting, a system that tops up fuel tanks with nitrogen, preventing jet fuel from catching fire. The first commercial jumbo jet, fitted with an inerting system, rolled out in the summer of 2005. And starting from 2007, all new Boeing 7 Series planes will feature the new technology. <laughs> 